So now that we have a little bit more time to talk on this show, one of the luxuries of it is I want to talk more about the culture. And I want to talk about the culture in a different way, I think, than conservatives usually talk about the culture. Obviously, if you were watching, I hope you were watching uh, last night when we premiered uh, Run, Hide, Fight, uh, our first uh, Daily Wire's first foray into film. And we're hoping to do a lot more of that uh, moving forward. And I'm hoping to be a big part of that because it's just so important uh, to me, to Jeremy, to Ben, to uh, transform the culture. That is what we started out to do. And really, in some ways, we all know that politics is, you know, when we say politics is downstream from culture, it doesn't necessarily mean that what happens in the culture changes politics. It it means we have to discuss how culture works. You know, T.S. Eliot, there's a wonderful line, a great poet, T.S. Eliot, Uh, said, the great poet in writing himself writes his time. In other words, that just by a a great poet, when he perceives his own experience and when he perceives his own vision of that experience and puts it down on paper, you get the entire age that he's living in. And when you get the age encapsulated in culture, it, it helps you to understand the culture, but it also guides the way you think about the culture, all of us, the way we think about the culture. And just to give you an example, uh, you know, superhero movies have become so exciting, you know, so uh, popular that they really are the movie business at this point. There is no movie business without superhero stories. And, and I really do suspect, and I'll talk about this another time at length, but I really do suspect that superhero movies are a way of imagining a transhuman future uh, that, is, that could, in fact, be coming down the pike. And it's one of the things that I think people are thinking about. And so it tells us something about our technological culture and the way we envision our humanity in good ways and in bad ways. And so What I want to do is I want to look at certain works of culture, not as, oh, here's the message that they gave and the message was good or bad. I always think that that's a a tremendously shallow way, actually, to look at a work of art. uh, Works of art do have themes and they do have uh, messages of a kind sometimes. And some of them are actually just political propaganda. Even good works of art like uh, 1984 can be political propaganda. And all of that is worth talking about. But one of the things that they really tell us is they tell us about the time that the work of art was made. They encapsulate a a vision of the time in which the work of art was made. And if the work of art is enough of a work of genius, if it's smart enough, if it's beautiful enough, they also are predictive. A great poet is not just a cultural uh, explainer, but he's also a seer. Because when you explain the time brilliantly, you can see everything that's implied in the time and you can start to see the future. It is a bizarre thing. My favorite example is always Hamlet. In Hamlet, uh, I believe that Hamlet is a a poem about the Reformation. Uh, Hamlet goes to Wittgenstein, which is where Luther started the Reformation, and he can't figure out what's real and what's not, what's good and what's bad, what's true and what's not true. And I believe that what Shakespeare was saying is now that the authority of the church to determine spiritual reality is gone, we are going to run into these problems. Who am I? Uh, What is my soul? What is what's real? What's good? What's bad? And in the famous mad scene in Hamlet, uh, Hamlet comes out pretending to be mad, but it's a question of whether he's pretending to be what he really is. That's the question that the scene kind of puts forward. And he says a lot of things that echo postmodernism. So he's asked, Polonius asks him, what are you reading? And he says, words, 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 which is a famous postmodern deconstructionist idea that words are devoid of true meaning and they are actually instruments of power. He says, nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so. That's, so that's moral relativism, which is an old and ancient idea, but came back with the death of the, of the church's monopoly on reality. Uh, he says, I could be uh, king of Infinite space. I can't remember the line, if, but it, I could be a king of infinite space if I didn't have bad dreams. So you, you even get a sense of Freudian psychology coming down the pike. So Shakespeare was so brilliant that when he described his time, the 17th uh, and 16th century, he was actually describing our time as well. He was predicting our time. So I want to look at a couple of things. The last really uh, great moment in American culture, which now is trash. Our culture now is absolute trash. It is broken just like every other aspect of our country right now. Uh, Our music is trash. Our television show is becoming trash. Movies are trash. Books are are non-existent. Uh, But the last great film, uh, the last great uh, uh, blow up of American culture was the golden age of television, which lasted from about 2000 to about 2010. And before I look at that, I want to look at what I think is the last great American movie. And when I say the last great American movie, I mean the last American movie that would be listed 
you know, on a list of 50 great American movies was, was The Godfather. Since then, there have been good movies. Uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy is a good movie. But the last truly great work of art film, I think, is The Godfather. And The Godfather had a really interesting take on what was going to happen to the country. It was not just examining the moment and not just examining the past moment when it takes place, but it was also uh, predictive of what was coming down the pike. It's, this story revolves around a kind of old-fashioned Don, Marlon Brando plays Don Corleone, who refuses to take on drugs because he thinks they're bad for people. And the, they have a great meeting of the five families, the five mafia families, and this fellow, I think this is Barzini, is that his name? He, he comes in and makes the case that no, uh, Marlon Brando has to help the other families deal in drugs. And here's what he says. Times have changed. It's not like the old days where we can do anything we want. A refusal is not the act of a friend. If Don Corleone had all the judges and the politicians in New York, then he must share them. All he loved is use them. He must let us draw the water from the well. Certainly he can present a bill for such services. After all, we are not communists. <laughs> So that's a wonderful scene because the value uh, there is we're not communists, we are capitalists, so he can pay, he can take money for delivering his corrupt judges. But the fact is that the world is now a very corrupt place where all the authorities are in the hands of the mobsters. And remember, he starts by saying, this is not the old days, we can no longer do what we want. And the end result, of course, is a famous scene where the, Michael Corleone, the son, is at a baptism while he's killing his enemies. You just play this MOS, play it without sound uh, in the background. He's killing his enemies while he is agreeing that he is going to uh, be a, fo a faithful follower of Christ. And it ends with a police officer, a, a mobster dressed as a police officer, killing guys and finally killing, I think it's Barzini himself, on the, on the steps in a scene that is reminiscent of a mobster scene in a Jimmy Cagney movie where Jimmy Cagney is killed by a cop on a flight of steps. Everything has been turned around. You know, the Christian... Uh, agreement to be a follower of Christ has become killing your enemies instead of loving your enemies. And the cops are now the mobsters and the mobsters are indistinguishable from the cops. So everything has been turned around. So the two themes there are things are not what they used to be. And the good times are gone. The old times are gone. And that our only value left is money, is capitalism. And that is reiterated in The Sopranos in the golden age of TV, which really was one of the great shows of the golden age of TV, when Tony Soprano, the mobster boss, comes to the psychiatrist uh, and complains that he's having panic attacks. It's good to be in something from the ground floor. I came too late for that. I know. But lately, I'm getting the feeling that I came in at the end. The best is over. Many Americans, I think, feel that way. I think about my father. He never reached the heights like me. But in a lot of ways, he had it better. He had his people. They had their standards. They had pride. Today, what do we got? <laughs> so the, this idea, this memory of the good old days of, of being a, a cowboy, essentially, they're talking about, when he talks about we've missed the best of times, he's talking about something that is more important to men than it is to women. He's talking about the death of the time when men had a large scope of action uh, in the wilderness. That's why we love cowboy movies or used to love cowboy movies. In space, when we went into space, there was an idea that we were still explorers, still going to the next new place. The space program is has virtually ended. Donald Trump was kind of bringing it back. And this idea that the best of times is over is one that deeply affects men. And if you look at the golden age of television, it's all about men becoming corrupt. Almost all the shows are about men becoming corrupt. The Sopranos, The Shield, Breaking Bad. And if you remember, Breaking Bad begins with this little man, Walter White, whose wife occasionally gives him some sexual favor offhandedly, so to speak. I'm making a pun there. Uh, on his birthday, uh, he is bullied by his boss. He is a failure in his profession. Uh, he is not a man. And then, of course, he gets cancer and he's going to die. And in order to support his family, he becomes a meth dealer. Killer. And he becomes a huge gangster and a killer and a murderer. He just becomes a terrible, terrible person, but he becomes a man. And that is one of the reasons I think gangster stories are so appealing to Americans is they bring back an idea of kingship, of knights, 
of, of being able to take full action. It's the idea that when might made right, as it did in the cowboy era, as it did in the knights in armor era, and as it does in the imagination of mobsters. But he comes back, and in order to become a man, in order to take the kind of action of scope, he has to become evil. And his excuse in the end is capitalism. His wife tells him to go to the, po the police, and he makes this famous speech. Who is it you think you see? Do you know how much I make a year? I mean, even if I told you, you wouldn't believe it. Do you know what would happen if I suddenly decided to stop going into work? A business big enough that it could be listed on the NASDAQ goes belly up, disappears. It ceases to exist without me. No, you clearly don't know who you're talking to. So let me clue you in. I am not in danger, Skyler. I am the danger. A guy opens his door and gets shot and you think that of me? No. I am the one who knocks. <laughs> that is a great piece of writing, by the way. It's just a terrific piece of writing and a great speech. But that is the expression of manhood expressed through capitalism. That's what it is. If you destroy me, if I go to the police, a business that could be listed in NASDAQ, mainly killing people through meth amphetamine sales and being a mobster goes out of business. All those people unemployed is clear a Ayn Rand uh, language. It explains to you why socialism is so appealing to young people. The reason socialism is so appealing to young people is that it comes with a value system packed inside it. The very economic system has a value system packed inside it that we all should share, that we all should be equal. Good values, values we love, that we should all have the, you know, nobody should be so powerful that he's above anyone else. What's the problem with that value system? The problem with that value system is, it, is that it is enforced by the state. The state become takes the place of God. And the idea that the state, Marx's idea was that the state would vanish, but of course that's never going to happen. The idea that the people who have got their greedy fingers on power are going to let that power go is absurd. So the value system, even though it has good values in it, you know, sharing and equality and all that never, ever works and only becomes an atrocity. The answer, of course, is a free market, but a free market with values. I hope you enjoyed that clip from The Andrew Clavin Show. If you did, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you stay up to date on all our future content.